Have you ever noticed the way that many of the people we find so incredibly funny are people who have actually gone through really hard things in their lives? Like something about tapping into that darkness actually fuels their sense of lightness or like an ability to hold life with both a lightness, but also a depth of meaning because they realize how fragile all of life is or, or just that life is so much bigger than the trivial things that we seem to focus on so often. And maybe even that having lived through really painful things sometimes fuels our art and creativity or maybe even, maybe even our sense of curiosity. Um, I've really been thinking about this a lot lately, especially as I look back at my own life and family history and how it's all affected my drive to ask deeper questions. My name is Brandy. I'm your host. This is a show called This Plus That about connecting the seemingly unconnectable and why it matters. And in today's conversation, I talk with Tyler Thrasher about the intersections of trauma plus curiosity, because behind all the plant rants and dressing up like a monstera and pretending to be a fern on social media, Tyler Thrasher has been through more than his fair share of pain. After a childhood of abuse and the sudden and shocking fire that destroyed Tyler and his wife Molly's home a few years ago, you think that Tyler might have given up on the inherent goodness of existence, but a wild outpouring of generosity that helped his family survive tragedy turned his perspective completely around. And through that perspective shift, he knew that he owed a karmic debt to return the generosity in kind. And now Tyler uses his creativity as a platform to support others who have escaped trauma. And it's those connections, again, between creativity, curiosity, and trauma that Tyler and I explore today. Whether we're exploring our own internal world as we seek inner safety in a world filled with chaos, or we turn outward onto the page or into the lab or down through ancient caves as a way to escape the turmoil around us, traumas and prints have a way of pushing our curiosity in one way or another. But if you've somehow never heard of Tyler before, he's an artist, scientist, and plant lover with an undying love for nature and its respective curiosities. But if you've somehow never heard of Tyler before, he's an artist, scientist, and plant lover with an undying love for nature and its respective curiosities. There are few things that his brain isn't obsessing over. Between his pursuits to crystallize the world, opalize everything, and hunt down some of the realm's most unique plants, his passion to combine art and science every step of the way is his fire and fuel. Chances are, if you catch Tyler at a party, he'll talk your ear off about exploring caves, growing minerals in his lab, playing Dungeons and Dragons, hybridizing new plants, electronic music, grappling with and overcoming trauma, and just how amazingly beautiful and mysterious this whole wide universe is. But when he's not spending time crystallizing insects, you can find him in the greenhouse, hybridizing plants, cultivating mutations, or screaming into the existential void, which is why we're going to be best friends. (laughs) You're also, in this conversation, going to hear us talk about Sophia Bush and our shared love of her, my forever crush, the racism of growing up and still living in Tulsa, and how art has always been an escape from that, not needing a degree to do science or call yourself a scientist, anxiety, mental health, and being exactly who you are and taking up space because there will always be people who hate what you do and jealousy in the art world. So all that being said, enjoy this conversation between me and my new friend, Tyler Thrasher, and the intersections of trauma plus curiosity. I start all of these episodes with a quote and it's always a quote from someone else. Cause I'm, I'm trying to sort of make connections between other artists or other works and you, right. That's, that's part of the whole point of this plus that I'm like doing this connecting work. And so a lot of them, I have been very long so far. And the one for you, I'm actually going to keep really short and I love it because uh, of course, you often refer to yourself online as a mad scientist. <laughs> and who better to start a conversation with than Alice in Wonderland and falling down a rabbit hole? <laughs> so uh, the quote I got was actually like, I was like, it has to involve the Mad Hatter because that just makes sense, I feel like. So it's the Mad Hatter asking, have I gone mad? And Alice just replies, I'm afraid so. You're entirely bonkers but I'll tell you a secret. All the best people are. (laughs) 
So that's where I wanted to start. And apparently also Lewis Carroll, when I was looking up more stuff on Alice in Wonderland, was a professor of math at Oxford University. And there are several mathematical and like logic influences in the book, which I didn't know before. That makes sense. That but makes it makes sense. total sense, right? All of these like polymath <laughs> kinds of people who are integrating different kinds of work. But mm -hmm. thank you for being on the show. I'm so excited to be chatting with you. I feel like if, if someone isn't already obsessed with you, we should probably just start with you <laughs> telling them what you do in the world as this mad scientist. Oh man. Uh, well, yeah, first off, thanks for having me. Um, I don't know where to start. I, uh, there's right, so that's many the problem with someone who likes so many things in the world. I do. Yeah. I mean, it's an ongoing list, but to sum it all up, uh, I spend my full-time job is I grow crystals on insects. And, uh, if I'm not I feel doing... like you're the only person in the world who can say that sentence. <laughs> yes. I may perhaps, um, that's my full-time job. When I'm not doing that, I'm probably in my greenhouse hybridizing and making new plants. Uh, if I'm not doing that, I'm probably done. I'm probably a dungeon master, um, at a, at a dungeons and dragons table. Uh, if I'm not doing that. I'm probably crawling through caves or out hiking through the Ozarks hunting for new, uh, cave systems. That's amazing. I also, when I was looking through your Instagram feed again, not long before we got online, uh, I saw that Sophia Bush is obsessed with you. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh man, now I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that until just recently. Um, yeah, she was in Tulsa for the centennial of the race massacre. And I was sitting outside of a bakery and, and she was like, Tyler. And I was like, oh my God. Oh, hi. Sophia? She was like, yeah. And she was like, I love your work. And I was like, uh, thank what? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's like one time I was working for a photographer in Boulder here in Colorado. And, uh, we were doing some photo sessions at a, rec a recording studio in Boulder and Sarah McLaughlin was playing. This was like right when I was out of college, I think. So this is when like Sarah McLaughlin was still like a real thing, you know, mm -hmm. like you were hearing about her frequently and she was playing a few songs live at the recording studio. And afterward she came into the, you know, the little like lobby area where everyone was standing. And I turned around at some point, you know, I'd been doing all these, like I was doing my job and I not noticing anything else. And I turn around and she's standing right behind me and she just sticks out her hand to go, hi, I'm Sarah. And I was like, I mean, no shit. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that's not what I said to her, but I was just sort of like, of course you are. Yeah, you're Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're Sarah. But Sophia Bush is one of my biggest crushes. So I feel oh, that's awesome. That she's yeah. With you. Yeah. Um, I had her come to the lab and uh, she she left with a bunch of crystallized bugs. And it was one of the one of the cooler evenings of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that would really top my list also. Uh, <laughs> but OK, so the ma the way I found you, just so you know that story, I don't think it's like it's anything that anyone else wouldn't have told you already. I, I, you know, I found you through Instagram and I, I honestly don't even know how I stumbled upon. I don't know if it was like a recommended to you sort of deal, mm -hmm. but I remember finding your profile. And at the time I was trying to like really figure out how I would describe, I think this is what a lot of us do who are into a lot of different things like you are, which is like, how, how on earth do I say what it is that I do? Like you said a second ago, <laughs> where do I even start? And I landed on your profile and I saw that it just said, just a curious kid. And I was like, well, that sums it up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that does a pretty good job. And then, uh, look through the rest of your stuff and I've been following you ever since. And then I happened to see that you were going to be in Denver for a pop-up. And I was like, I'm, I have to find him. Cause I had, <laughs> I had already emailed you about being on the podcast. And I was like, Oh, I'm going, I'm going to make this happen. And then awkwardly, of course, approached you at that. And I must've gotten lucky because I was there when the, only a few people were there. And apparently not only was it raining cats and dogs, which never happens in Denver. So mm -hmm. you just really lucked out, but there were only a few people left. And so I did get the opportunity to come up to you and have a few minutes to chat and, you know, finagle you to be on the show. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, that pop-up was crazy. It was like raining. There was a line of people for most of it. And then, yeah, I think you, you made it right at the, like, 
you know, the tail end when it was slowing down. <laughs> yeah. I was like, the universe is really in my favor today. So I don't know what I did, but I missed both the rain and the line. So that's pretty magical. <laughs> Though I did miss out on basically everything else you were selling. Cause of course it had all been swiped up. Yeah. <laughs> that happens. So that's my fault. I got lucky in one way, but not in others. But. <laughs> you know, thankfully we can all buy your work regardless, but yeah, so that's, that's how I came across your work. And, uh, you know, of course I, I have a history in the last few years of being really obsessed with art and science. So I've just really appreciated following along someone who had such a deep intersection in both and was really talking about why that was so important in the world. So it's been fun to follow you ever since. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I know that we were going to talk about, I'm sure we're going to talk about some art and science today, but I know that you actually, you just released a t-shirt or a few t-shirts really. I know that you've done some prints and t-shirts from some of your botanical like insect drawings also, but mm -hmm. in particular, I was going to bring up the, you know, the t-shirt that's helping you to raise some funds for kids and teenagers who are fleeing from trauma. And I was going to ask you to talk about that actually instead, and maybe also where that drive for you. Cause I know that when you, so you have this whole gang, so you call the do good gang <laughs> yeah. that you started. And so you have a, uh, you know, propensity for doing this sort of thing of, of doing your art and science and using it to help fundraise for other causes. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering sort of where that comes from in your world. Yeah. Life. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm no like stranger to talking about sort of the trauma that I had survived growing up. Uh, I, I came from a pretty dark upbringing and one of the things that I think stuck with me growing up is how little uh, people care or how little people intervene when things are painfully obvious. Um, and that's from like severe things to witnessing abuse to like realizing someone needs help and you have the resources. And it's just so easy sometimes to just carry on with your day. And when we all act like this, we end up with things like a pandemic or like the Delta variant where it's like, yeah, when we all think and act for ourselves and don't consider that this is one big enclosure, like we all need to be taken care of. And that has always been in me since a child. Um, I've always had this kind of like fervor and anger about how little some of us care. Uh, and so when my art started taking off and I was like no longer worrying about where my next meal was going to come from when I was no longer worrying about some of the things that plagued me as a child, um, I had some extra resources and I was realizing like, Oh my gosh, I have a huge audience. I could list a shirt and then sell it and be, have a pretty successful art drop. And something just was like inside me saying, you have an immense resource at your hands. You can either stick on Instagram, do the Instagram thing, sell your art, and then, you know, do the, like, I'm a Be successful, yeah, I could do that stupid influencer. I'm a successful artist bullshit, or I could just be a fucking human and care and use that platform while I'm here on this earth to, to do a little bit of good to at least care and help others. Yeah. And on other things that I've heard you on other podcasts and such, I've, I, I hear you talk about the story of growing up with a dad who ran a nursery and the magicalness of even sleeping within a, in a greenhouse and mm -hmm. all of those things. But, you know, and telling the story, at least I've heard of your, your dad, but I, you know, I, I, it seems sort of whimsical, you know? So I wanted to go like, what is it that really drives you? And again, we don't have to get super personal yeah. if you don't want to, but I just, I here, let me go first, I guess I'm going to say, so recently I wrote something about, um, I was just exploring my own childhood and I, I grew up in the house of an alcoholic mother and Earlier this week, I put out a newsletter that was t that was talking about the intersections of uh, alcoholism and quantum physics, <laughs> which is an, an odd intersection, but uh, how quantum physics basically was helping me to see, uh, to hold polarity and to go, maybe she's not just a monster. Maybe she's also beautiful in these other regards. And it doesn't mean that I necessarily have to have a close relationship with her, but she passed away in 2014 and we were estranged for the last several years of her life. But just now I'm, 
I'm finding part of how I started that newsletter was just talking about how I'm actually realizing. And I, I mean, I think if you follow anyone who talks about even their own struggles with alcoholism, that it tends to sort of wipe away any interest in surface level things. Like you're just Mm -hmm. a human who's, who's really deeply interested in going deeper in life. Mm -hmm. So I was actually realizing for myself that growing up in that environment helped me be the kind of curious person I am. Cause I actually want to dig for those things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I agree. Um, I think a lot of my curiosity came from this need to find a distraction and to survive my, my childhood home. Um, and my family has a, a pretty extensive lineage of abuse and neglect. Mm. Um, my dad, you know, my dad tells me these stories of like how he was the product of an affair. He grew up in Bedford, Iowa, and they're just, you know, like the picture Bedford, Iowa, and like there's a small town mentality. And when you're one of like nine kids and you were the product of an affair and then the 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 father, the husband of the household, like blames it all on you and then bows out and says, screw this. And all that weight is on one kid. And then um, my mother, she, she, uh, she survived a lot of abuse. She was in and out of the foster care system. Um, And essentially what ended up happening is uh, two people who had no business getting married. And this happens all the time. Two people have no business getting married, get married. They ignore all the signs, all the people around them that are like, Hey, this isn't really working. You guys are fighting in public. You guys are hitting each other. Like you guys, it's just chaos. Um, and then those people decide to have kids because they think that will fix the marriage. I mean, that's, that's a very common narrative where mm-hmm. when nothing else is working, it's like, well, let's just have kids. Right. Um, and then those kids are left with the pieces. Uh, and that was kind of my, my upbringing was uh, there was, um, a a lot of alcoholism, um, a lot of physical abuse, a lot of neighbors that could hear and watch things happening and no one intervened teachers. Um, you know, we'd go to school with, you know, sweaters and button ups and khakis and everything to to like build this illusion that things are great at home. Uh, but in reality, all those long sleeves were covering up bruises and scars and, uh, I ended up, you know, you mentioned like living in a greenhouse, um, my dad was a nurseryman and uh, a landscaper and he opened up his own retail greenhouse. Uh, and we, well, I do talk about the whimsies of living in that greenhouse. A lot of it was to hide. Like we were being protected from all the, uh, most of the abuse. Um, and so, yes, it was magical to like wake up under canopies of bougainvillea and the smell of fertilizers and the sounds of, you know, geranium benches dripping with water. Like that was my day to day. But the reality was, is that we were sleeping in the greenhouse because it wasn't safe to be home. Um, and so I grew, I grew up with this dichotomy. Like I'm surrounded by such an interesting life. Mm -hmm. I'm sleeping and living in a greenhouse or beautiful. Yeah. And, or, you know, my dad had these elaborate luscious gardens I would explore. Like I would always go behind these massive hostas and, um, my dad put in like four ponds at our house and I would, it was always something to play with and look at and be in awe of. But half the time I was outside because I didn't want to be inside the house. And so I've had this dichotomy of, wow, the world's beautiful. There's so much nature, but it was a distraction from some of the like horrors I was living through and surviving. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. I think for me, I, you know, I didn't have that sort of extra space to go to and I was an only child. And so a lot of it was, Mm -hmm. was really just me and, and me sort of navigating my own experience and also not having any brothers or sisters uh, or siblings to, to, to go like, what the fuck is happening here? (laughs) But also I think, uh, well, yeah, I think, I think because I didn't really have a space to, you know, eject myself to a lot of that did become the interior world. Right. So that I was just like, okay, I'm just going to go inside. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I think that is where a lot of my sort of where trauma intersects with curiosity for me because Mm -hmm you know, it was like, what's going on in here? What's happening in yeah. here? I'm just going to be in here. I'm going to build whole worlds. You know, it's like well, Dungeons that's... and Dragons, but inside myself. <laughs> well, and that's true. I mean, like 
you know, I was just saying about that the other day, I spent a lot of time talking to myself, arguing with myself, uh, just like building these elaborate narratives. And it, it's true. Like when you come from an abusive household, there's no connection. You can't connect with the people that are raising you in a meaningful way. There's no time for them to sit and talk to you about what you're into or, or help you explore curiosity. So you have to always go inward. Like the only person you have is yourself mm -hmm. and kids are very good at getting distracted. Kids are already naturally good at being curious, but it just forces you, it builds this habit of, wow, it's just me. Um, and as an adult that, kind of perpetuates itself into like, you know, I don't know if you do this, but like walking around talking to yourself or standing in the shower for 45 minutes, just like getting swept up in some crazy narrative that you fabricated. And then you're like, Oh shit. I'm like in the real, I'm supposed to be in the real world. What am I yeah. doing? <laughs> yeah, completely. I mean, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Getting stuck in your head is because you're so used to building those internal worlds mm -hmm. can, it can be really hard to drop down into your body. Right. I think is, which is why, like when as an adult, we're trying to navigate, especially art, you know, being curious and, you know, producing something that's meaningful to us that it, you know, we sort of have to contend with unpacking those traumas because mm -hmm. when you're, when your art is inherently vulnerable, right. And so when you're sort of digging into your own vulnerabilities to talk about things that are matter to you and producing work that matters to you and putting that out in the world in front of other people to judge and look at and, you know, perceive in their own ways, mm -hmm. then yeah, it, it, it can be really scary. And yeah. And I think there's just a process of, um, of learning that that vulnerability is okay. You know, building a sense of safety for yourself. Mm -hmm. And as an adult also, I'm sure just like getting to create like a real world for yourself where like you have real safety and support and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's been really interesting because I'm experiencing this parallel or this like, um, opposite life where growing up, I was very neglected and I was bullied in school too. Um, you know, like once kids in school find out that, you know, you're being hit at home and all this horrible stuff, kids are, kids are awful. Fuck, they're cruel. Really they mean. can be real specifically, I think in public school, Yeah. um, there's something there, but, uh, yeah, you get picked on. So at school, there's no sh shelter or safety. You're bullied at home. There's no safety literally. And now my art's taken off. I'm my own adult. I'm paving my own life, my own path. And it's really strange to have people say, Tyler, we love your art or Tyler. We think, you know, we think good thoughts about you um, or Tyler, here's some attention. It is really interesting and jarring. And I don't always respond the best way to it. Like I get really like frozen when someone compliments me online or if I meet someone at a pop-up and they're like, I love you. I love your art. I love what you stand for. And I'm like, what? And I'm, you know, I, my life is split in two halves. Like my yeah. career didn't really take off till, I was about, you know, 23. Um, and the last That's four years, good. yeah, well, it's crazy. Like the last four years or so is when, you know, I started kind of getting a feel for how people feel about me as a separate human. Mm -hmm. And so it's all new. It's very new to get so many words of affirmation and so much support when the majority of my life was not the case. Yeah. It's I also, there was one part you said earlier about how, you know, when you were going through that as a kid, that your neighbors and folks like weren't really seeing you. And you had mentioned when I asked, um, you know, why you contribute so much of your time to, to raising funds for these other causes and talking about these really hard things in the world. And you had said, you know, people just don't see what's happening, mm -hmm. you know? So cl clearly there was something I think in your life about being like uh, unseen, you know, yeah. like here, here I am. And I think, especially now as an adult, when you're like, here's my art, do you see it? You know, it can be really, <laughs> it can be so hard when yeah. people are like, yeah, I see that. And here's my perception of that. And I love it. And you're like, yeah. what? <laughs> it's, well, it's strange. And, um, like, oh, you know, I think for me, I hear a, a, very often, that it's hard to feel like you can have a normal life after abuse, after growing up with abuse and trauma, that 
and I think this way, I used to, that life is just dark. Like once you've had a dark upbringing, you know, that's just kind of the gritty nature of your life that people don't change. Life sucks. Um, all this shit. And I've been proven otherwise, you know, I used to be very jaded and it's hard to be jaded when, you know, like Molly and I had a house fire a few years ago and we lost everything. Right. And like a thousand strangers came together to raise money to get us back on our feet. Once that happens, like the day that happened, I looked at my life and I said, you're not allowed to be jaded anymore. You're not allowed to walk on this planet and say that people suck, that everyone sucks and no one changes um, because a thousand people just proved you wrong. That a thousand people could care about a stranger so much that they'd want to come together to help get them back on their feet. And it was that moment when I said, I have a debt to the universe. Like the universe did me dirty for the first <laughs> couple of decades of my life. I, you know, the, we got that squared up. I think the yeah, universe yeah, and I are on yeah. the same page. And then the <laughs> universe was like, Hey man, but hold up. That's not all there is to this. You know, yeah, there's more. There's more. Um, and that was just the first qu quarter of your life. And that's not the best part. Like that's not the most important part. Uh, and after that happened, after pe we had this GoFundMe that we didn't even put together, people put it together for us. I, I said, I have a debt to the universe. And that debt is about $18,000. Cause that's how much money was raised to get us clothes and get my computer back and somewhere to uh, like, wow. you know, get us back on feet. I said, I have a debt of about $18,000 and I dedicated my art. I said, I gotta, I gotta clear that debt before I even clear my own debt, like my student loans and shit. Um, and that pushed me to give back. So last year I started doing fundraisers for the shirts. I started making shirt designs with causes. And um, the big one we had done was the raise some heck shirt. And we ended up raising $75,000. Um, and after that, I was like, oh shit. I was like, I looked at the universe and said, we squared up. We're, we're good. Square. Yeah. Um, and, and I, and I started kind of changing how I looked at the universe. I said, you know, it's like a dance. I think the universe and I have this conversation where it's like, you give some, I give some, and as long as we do our parts, like I'm in agreement, I'm not going to look at you universe and blame you for the dark shit. I survived. You're not fully responsible. My parents, <laughs> partially, 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 not fully, partially, but my parents, <laughs> deserve most of the blame, but I deserve a lot of the credit for finding the strength to survive. And that goes for any trauma or abuse survivor. Um, and so I was like, okay, look, I'm going to give you some, you could give me some, here's what I want universe. And I say this about every day. I'm like, this is what I want. And you need to tell me what you want. And I will make sure I do that because you're in control here and you're going to make sure that I can make sure I do that. So, um, that's kind of my initiative behind and my, or my incentive behind like, raising money, doing these shirt drops, using my art to give back because I have an immense um, amount of success uh, with my work, which I never thought was ever going to happen. And I got to keep up that agreement. I want to keep up that agreement because uh, it's like one of the only good, reliable things I've experienced in my life. <laughs> yeah. I have so many things to say to all of that. I, I, the first one is I love not much more than hearing scientists talk about sort of woo kinds of things, you know, just a little, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know like you're not, I think I've heard you say you're not really a woo person, but like the idea that you're in some sort of dance with the universe is still, uh, you know, I, I think no matter what you believe, we all have sort some sort of experience and being able to explain like that weird. I also heard on another, another project, uh, podcast, you said something like the world operates on random, beautiful accidents, you know, yeah. there's, <laughs> you know, in the chaos, there's also these synchronous, amazing things that happen like that, that you do feel when you've been gifted with that, a sort of mm -hmm. debt. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm, I, there is a part of me that's like, maybe, you know, it's a dance with the universe, but it's mostly mainly a dance with myself. You know, I'm in the universe. I'm, I'm, you and I are composed of the things in the universe scientifically, yeah. but yeah. it's a dance within myself to keep me going that I've been given this energy, um, this, this resource. Um, and I, I can see things pretty clearly where I'm like, okay, this is the next step. This is the next step. Don't forget about the people next to you. Like right. as you're moving, you know, humanity in life, it's one big hike that we're all taking together. We all like to think that there's only so much room on the trail. Screw you. I'm going to push you off the side of the cliff. That's not it. I mean, we're all tied together. You, we got to think like this and move like this together. Um, 
And I just don't, I can't imagine living any other way. I spent so much of my life alone and scared and kind of watching my parents suffer through the consequences of pushing everyone away and living in a self-destructive way. So I'm going to do the opposite of that until I die. I'm, I'm going to live a meaningful, impactful, helpful, um, intentional life. And I'm not going to push everyone away and I'm not going to hurt those around me. Like I got to experience that and I hated it. And I want the exact opposite of that, um, in my life. Yeah. And you feel like the going through that fire is the thing that really clicked that in for you. A thousand percent. I mean, it clicked in a couple of things. It showed me that humanity is great. It's good. Um, most people I think just don't know how they can help. And most people are suffering through their own abuse and trauma. And uh, we're very lonely. We're all very isolated, not just because of the pandemic, but we work, we are put in these systems that keep us separate. And we are a communal species. We're a communal animal, but so much of us just live in these boxes by ourselves. That fire showed me that humanity needs to come together and wonderful things happen when we do. It also showed me that very few things matter. Um, when you have a house full of art and projects and things you've collected, um, and you know, I lost a pet, like when you can lose everything in about 10 minutes, um, it really drives home the fact that we do live in a very seemingly chaotic, spontaneous bubble you are not like safe from random chaos, which showed me you need to enjoy every goddamn moment you have. And you need, and you just need to be very, I don't know, careful and meaningful with how you live because you could go out for a drink for an hour and come back and your house is gone. Um, and, and it showed me to not hold on to so much, you know, like, okay it just taught me like it's things will leave things will go things come and go that's energy is exchange that's how this works and you don't get to pick that so pick the things you care about and fight vehemently for those things but also be prepared to watch everything flutter away and find use elsewhere because that's how this works yeah it's a, it's a lot of holding things really lightly and also yeah when everything gets taken away only the essential remains, right? You yep. learn, you learn the things that are the most essential. And, but I think even in that, that sort of the other side of what you're talking about is that like, when you realize what is the only stuff that's really essential and knowing that most of us live every day well beyond that, mm -hmm. then I think everything else also feels like a debt. You're like, this is just, this is just ra random gift I get to experience. Yep. And that's pretty yep. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, um, it, yeah, it does. I mean, it shows you like, I, I remember we had to write down a spreadsheet of all the shit we lost for the insurance company. And they were like, we need to know everything you lost and the value. And I was like, how the fuck am I supposed to do that? Like they like take your life and imagine all of it just gone. And then someone tells you, you know, Brandy, you have, you know, about a week to submit everything you lost in the back. You couldn't, you'd go through every book, every, every item and every drawer. You, it's, you're just like, Oh my. And you're just like, wow, we collect so much shit. And at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is you, your friends, your partners, the people around you. When we came home, it was me and my wife and we had the clothes on our back and, that was it. And I was like, wow, man, holy shit. Wow. Everything else is gone, but we're still here. And I guess I'll just keep my head up and do my best. And I survived. I made it. Yeah. You sure so did. it didn't seem like we would, but we yeah. did. I'm sure like if you're listening, I feel like you're either running straight to a spreadsheet now to catalog everything <laughs> in your house or you're like, I could never do that. So I'm just going to let it go. <laughs> uh, you'll do your best. You'll, you'll find a middle ground. Yeah. You'll There's find a middle ground. Yeah. It was funny though. Cause I, I had heard you tell this, uh, the story about your house catching on fire and something else also. And you know, it, you had actually said the sort of specifics of how it happened that, you know, the, the newspaper in your like insulation in your house that you owned and the electrical catching it on fire. And, and I was sitting in my house that I own and my house was built in 1942. So not like within a several years of when that house of yours had been built. And my dad does a little bit of electrical work and he's done some stuff in my house before and been like, just 
maybe ignore what's behind the walls. <laughs> like, I don't think there's newspaper here, but it's like the wiring is like, you know, fra- yeah. you know, frazzled and yeah. not covered and whatever. And so I was like, well, I should probably pay attention to that and stop ignoring it. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm going to also assume now that as an adult as well, that living in Tulsa as a black man also brings some things with it. <laughs> like uh, some of the trauma. Yeah, some of the <laughs> trauma. Um, and, and I'm guessing also like what I feel like I would describe as your sort of propensity for helping, you know, like you said earlier, I guess, the like, please see me. Mm-hmm. And you have a way of perceiving me, but it, there's a good chance it's not what you've been told. Mm-hmm. You know, like I'm not necessarily what you've been told. Do you feel like, do you feel like home actually feeds into your work at all? Like how, how does that feed in? Cause you grew up in Tulsa, right? Yeah. Born and raised, um, went to school in Springfield, Missouri. And my work's very young, but I think it's starting to, I think I'm still trying, I think I'm still understanding what it is I'm doing, but there was definitely also this need like Tulsa, uh, you know, the Tulsa race massacre, like one of the most violent acts of racial hate in American history, you know, all happened in a, like a burst of a few moments. Um, Mm -hmm. and Tulsa has been segregated since then. I went to school, uh, at, I went to school, an uh, elementary school called Robert E. Lee Elementary. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all over the South. I grew up in Dallas, so I completely understand that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I went to school where I went to middle school where I had a teacher that um, got caught calling a group of students the N word. Um, I went to school where white students would make fun of me and call me, you know, I'm, I'm half black. I'm, I'm biracial. And I'd have students, white students call me a mutt regularly. Um, uh, you know, so that, that was what, like, I grew up with the racism. Uh, I would spend the, or spend the night at like my friend's house and I'd be the only black or Brown fucking kid in the whole house. And I was treated differently. Um, Mm -hmm the watermelon jokes, the Kool-Aid jokes, the, this, the, that, the cotton jokes all fucking day fried chicken, all the fried chicken and all from the stupid white dads who yell at their wives like that. <laughs> that was such a staple growing up is, um, and I, so I, I, that did play a role in me feeling isolated. And in that isolation, I thought, well, I can't rely on people, parents, teachers, teachers are watching these students call me a dirty mutt and they're not saying it. And I, most of them are white and they're just laughing at it. They don't care. Um, cause it doesn't affect them. And so I just found an escape in art. If I was drawing and doodling, nobody could bother me. And if people did bother me, I had, I was justified in snapping at them or yell or telling them to fuck off because they couldn't bother me. And that was something people understood. I could be sketching and drawing. If someone was like, Hey Tyler, I'm like, Hey, can you fuck? Like, I would literally say, Hey, fuck off. I'm working. I was like 14 or 15 saying I'm working. It was my escape and my excuse mm-hmm. to say, okay, no one's been here for me. It's just me. Uh, and then there were people that came around. I had wonderful, wonderful teachers that came around um, and helped and helped kind of pull me out of my sketchbook and out of my shell. Um, but then growing up, being an adult, learning about the severity of racism, like you live it and then you're an adult and there's something maybe you could help do about that. And, uh, you know, like walking in a parking lot and there's subtle things like walking through a parking lot and watching a white man pull his partner in, you know, watching a white man pull his girlfriend closer when I walk by or one of my favorite things to do. when I walk past uh, a white person in the parking lot as I turn around and I watch them check for their wallet, um, you know, or the security guard that sees me come in and they just kind of eyeball me while I walk around. Um, there's all these subtleties and most of these people are well-meaning. They didn't pick to act or think like that. You know, a system taught them. They've been swimming in a water that told them that that was how to live. Yeah. And if you go up to any of these people and say, hey, like if I walk past, you know, if I walk past a white man pulling in his girlfriend, if I said, hey, can I talk to you too? Uh, You're both a little fucking racist. They'd be like, what? No, no. uh, uh," And they would have like a million excuses why they're not. And I'm like, well, but here's why. And they still wouldn't see it because they'd be like, well, I didn't call you the N word. Like, like. I I caught on that for a lot of people in Tulsa, a lot of white Tulsans, their definition of racism was 
hey, I didn't lynch you. And I'm like, that's not where we set the bar. Like, yeah, that's that's a pretty high bar. Yeah. Low bar, depending on how you look at it. Like you locking your car when I walk by is racism because you, you think I'm capable of something just based on my, you don't know me. It's just my appearance, the color of my skin, you know? Uh, and that, I think that did feed into like, I'm, I don't want to live in this world like this. So I'm going to help. I'm going to give back and I'm going to support black causes. Um, especially after the George Floyd murder and, you just, I saw a lot of white people kind of have this reckoning where they're like, Oh my God, the world's fucked. And I'm like, it's been like that. Yeah. And it was so funny, like to watch this happen with all my white friends. I watched every single white friend I had who I love dearly have this flood of white guilt where they're like, Tyler, Oh my God, what's happening. And I'm like, what do, what do you mean? What's happening? And they're like, he, they choked him. They choked him for nine. Minutes. And I was like, that's the third video I've seen this month of that happening. Like it didn't start with George Floyd. That was just, that happened to be the one that got a bunch of white people in Tulsa uh, and around the world caring. Um, and so it did help wake me up too, where I'm like, Oh my God, some of these white people just literally think the world's dandy because it is for them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it forced a lot of people to look at the world the way that I want other people to look at the world, which is like, it's not just about us and our lives. We can't live that way. Um, Cause a lot of people get sort of just, they just drift away. Like we just forget so many people when we live like that. Yeah. I, I was going to say too, I just feel like, you know, one of the things I really admire about you as someone who barely knows you, but knows you from the internet, <laughs> <laughs> like so many of us is you just seem to have this remarkable ability to take up space. The, in the way that you are just, it, it feels to me like so much of who you are. Like there's, there's not a lot of veneer, right, between us and you and your everyday life. And, you know, earlier when you were talking about, um, you know, that the fire, the fire is the thing that sort of helped you click into going like the universe I owe a debt to the universe and I'm in this dance with the universe or what have you. But also like, I was, I, I just feel like I wonder if you also have some story about what actually helped you get there in terms of being in that, like isolated, it's just me, I'm taking care of myself to this person who puts out art. And also in doing that is like, I'm going to be my full self publicly and you can take it or leave it. I don't really care what you think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think and, and again, I'm going to say that's an impression that might not be your experience of it, but well, I definitely do try to do that. Um, if I'm being honest, I do have a crippling amount of social anxiety. Like, like I, I can, for me, a lot of that is like kind of fake it till you make it like be an act the way that you feel like is good. Like I want to put my life out there. I want people to know, um, Okay. So before I get too branched off the, the truth, the real truth of the matter is I'm horribly anxious. Like, mm. and I'll be upfront about that. Um, I get really flustered when there's a lot of noise. Like, uh, I, I get really socially anxious. I get burnt out pretty quick in social situations, I, but I also get these random bursts of energy. So if you follow my social media, you know, usually it's kind of like chill and then you'll see me do some silly, crazy, stupid series of videos. Cause I get these bursts of like, energy and then I go back down to a lower state. Um, at least as I'm getting older, that seems to be the case, but I think I had to learn early on that no matter how I live, I'm going to have people that are going to disagree with me. People that are going to agree with me, people that aren't going to care for what I said and people who are going to really latch on to what I said. And that's the case for every human. Uh, you know, like it was especially last year. Uh, I want a good example that comes to mind is, one of my friends in Tulsa made a shirt that said black mental health matters. And I said, this is, that's great. That's great. Cause we forget about black mental health. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the, the, the healthcare industry and healthcare field, they don't, they don't talk about how mental health for black Americans is different than white Americans because they live a very different traumatizing life. Um, and I, I posted myself wearing this shirt and I was like, this is important. Like, this is something we should be looking into. And I had people say, um, 
that's kind of racist toward white mental health. And I sat there and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I thought it was sarcasm. I was laughing at first. I was like, cause I have a dark sense of humor. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, Oh, you're being stupid and funny. You can't possibly believe that. They, and I would say that I would go like, what are you serious? And like, yeah, I was like, all mental health matters. I'm like, I can't, I cannot. And I, I, everything I said with that post was very well intentioned. It was wholesome. It was good. It was real. And there'll still be people who said, who will say, no, I hate what you just said. I'm like, I didn't say anything bad. I literally didn't say anything bad. Like I get, we have opinions, but this is a fact. I said nothing wrong in this post and you hate what I said. And once that happened, it's just something fucking snapped in my brain where I was like, doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Just live your fucking life. You could do the right thing every single time. And there'll still be some small person who's got to pop up for just two seconds and go, uh, I'm not, I don't like that. And it's like, I don't care. Move. And I just learned, like, just keep going, you know, just like, just drive over the pothole. Like that person, you're not going to remember their name. You're not going to remember how they felt. You're not going to care if you live your life. Um, and that kind of helped me say, take up space, take up space. Because how many times do I have to move out of the way in the grocery store aisle when a white person with a shopping cart tr comes by and they don't move for me, you know? And it's like, you see like the that series on YouTube where like women will walk down sidewalks and they, they're like, you know what? I'm not going to move out of the way for men this time. And they end up bumping into it. <laughs> like, so, no, I have tried that because I walk around my neighborhood all the time and sometimes I do it as an experiment and yeah. it's shocking. It, it's sad. And so it's like, I guess bump into some people. If you're going to live your life and you're going to do what's healthy for you and people are going to get bumped into, just fucking just bump into them, you know? And they, you won't remember them. They won't remember you, but at least... <laughs> You did what was good for you. <laughs> yeah, that's all you've got. I, and, and I think, I mean, I think really in a lot of ways, this this podcast is an experience. It's it's my own experiment of trying to do that in the world, right? Because this plus that is me going. These things that seem contradictory about me, like so a lot of my background and story, for instance, is, you know, growing up in Dallas, I came, I didn't grow up in a Christian family, but I grew up swimming in Christianity, Mm -hmm. And then in high school, I, you know, because I think a lot of the stuff I experienced in my childhood with alcoholism and, you know, the household I was in with my parents, you know, I, I found a group of friends who were Christians, but they were the most incredible humans I'd ever met. And we became really close friends. And so I started going to, to churchy things. And then it didn't take very long to realize, like it was mostly when I went to college, I was like, oh, this isn't everything. Th these people aren't like the other people I knew. This feels really not good to me. And so I have this whole sort of like, I have this whole, you know, sort of churchy background and then, you know, later in my life, I came out at around 27 and now I'm, I'm just as like a nearly 40 year old person, I'm like navigating all these things around, you know, integrating both or like learning, especially like as I'm doing something public, right? So like I'm, I'm starting to do this podcast more and doing more of my art and writing publicly and I'm seeing how I'm like sort of tiptoeing around things because I know that I have certain people who follow me who are like very still very like faithy and I mm -hmm. have other people who follow me who are very sciencey and uh, those dichotomies exist all over the place in my life it's not mm -hmm. just like the faith versus science or art versus science or whatever they're everywhere and I could feel over the last several weeks of really working on a lot of stuff that I I, I felt myself tiptoeing and, you know, I think me doing this is actually forcing myself to go, Brandy, you have to reconcile, not reconcile, but you have to learn how to hold these tensions. And you have to realize that a lot of people who aren't up for doing that, who aren't willing to sort of go, I see both sides or all sides or whatever. I see the complexities mm -hmm. and the nuance here. People are going to be pissed. Like there are some people who just aren't going to like it. And you yeah. can't spend your entire life hiding these things about yourself and, trying to figure out wherever that line is because the goalpost moves all the time right? exactly so yeah i well and that's like like 
you mentioning, yeah, I grew up, you know, Midwest, it's just mega churches everywhere. And that was one thing that I learned as well. It's like one of the biggest conversations, like one of the most frequent conversations when you meet someone new in the Midwest, you, I'm willing to bet every goddamn time I meet someone new, we don't get about 20 minutes in before they're like, so, uh, uh what church do you go to? I love the smacking involved also all the time. Like yeah. Like, impression. They're like, what church do you go to? And I'm like, I, you, we don't want to, you don't want to have this conversation with me. Like I'm totally chill with your beliefs. I'm totally chill with it, but I have my opinions on, on the church and the violence that the church has instigated. And I was like, we can't go down this rabbit hole. And, and I you learned have like six hours to talk. It's going to yes. take a minute. Yeah. And I, and I've learned that, uh, and this isn't me harping on religion, but there's a certain level of audacity that comes with the Christian church where you you assume what you have to say is the most important thing. And so you don't consider so a lot of my Christian friends, like they don't consider how others might feel. It's like they have a self ordained mission to share what it is they're living and the audacity in which they do that. It's like, there's no private space. They will come into your space to do this. And I thought, what if I lived that way, but as an artist and someone who advocates for mental health, mm -hmm. you know, and I wasn't, like I'm, I'm going to claim the same amount of space that they tend to. Yeah. I'm like, they're going to corner me at a coffee shop and be like, Hey man, you should come to, you should come to victory Christian church. You should come. I think you really like the message. And I'm like, I think you should go to therapy. And I think you should back the fuck up a little bit. Cause you're crossing <laughs> over my boundaries. And they're like, what? And they're like language. I'm like, fuck that. And like, what? And I'm like, yeah, how's it feel like you take up space. I'm going to take up space. We're in public. Yeah. It's an arena. Let's go. Like yeah. Brandy, you should take up, take up your space. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's like your own experiment and like what women do when they're walking down the sidewalk with <laughs> you're just going like, I'm finally just going to stand here. And if you want to bump into me, it's your problem, but yeah. I'm doing yeah. it here. You're like, at least I'm prepared to bump into you. You're going to get caught off guard. <laughs> yeah, You're the one who's going to be surprised. Um, so this might be a little non sequitur, but I, I also want to know, like, similarly, if you like faced, re I'm guessing you as a human who's done all of these things that you've faced a, some rejection, both and being someone who is interested in a lot of things and being told that you couldn't be that, that you had to do only one thing. And also either in like the science community or in the art community sort of going, you're not really one or the either. We don't really accept you. So like, have you, ha what kinds of rejection have you experienced in doing that kind of work in the world across like disciplines? Oh man. A lot, I'm sure. Well, I've been kind of fortunate because I have found something that works just for me. Um, I haven't really tried collaborating with a lot of other people. And so I found something that's like works in Tyler world. Like I feel like I'm doing and making enough things where I don't need to go collaborate with universities. Like a lot of rejection that you experience is in the profession itself. Well, luckily for me, I'm not doing peer reviewed research with a bunch of other scientists. I'm just tinkering and sharing what I'm learning. Yeah. Um, I do struggle sometimes to call myself a scientist. And I realize and remember that there were scientists before there were degrees. I don't have a science degree, yeah, um, I was gonna ask. but I think like a scientist, I act like a scientist. Um, I have the curiosity of a scientist and an artist and I know this. So I haven't got, I haven't really had to face rejection quite like that. I have had people comment before, like, you know, it's just people comment and they'll be like, what, why do we get to call him a scientist? Like he didn't go to school and I'm going in debt for yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, well, what are you going in debt for? And they're Sorry like, for your poor choices in the world. Oh, yeah. Well, and they have these people. It's like most people, they criticize from a place of insecurity. And I learned that as well, that when people comment and say, well, you're not really a scientist, like I'm going to actual school. And I'm like, well, what are you going for? And they're like, I want to be a neuro, you know, I want to be a <laughs> a neuroscientist or a doctor. I'm like, well, I'm glad you're getting the degree. You need it. I don't need a, a, a degree to grow opals. I don't need a degree to make high plant hybrids. Obviously I don't need to go $200,000 in debt to do what I love. So, and I've had a lot of ins like uh, universities reach out to me to ask me to do talks. I've given a lot of talks and stuff. And I've had like, I, I met uh, a NASA scientist, a NASA engineer at one of my art shows. And she was like, I love your art. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, well, I was like, what do you do? And she's like, well, we just landed a, you know, we just landed a Rover on an asteroid. And I'm like, no big deal. 
I was like, what are you doing here? I was like, you, <laughs> I was like, I have crystals on bugs. And she's like, I just love what you, you know, and I, I have met and worked with other really amazing scientists. Strangely enough, most of them are women. I have like most of the people, like my best experiences in the science field have been with and collaborating with female scientists, um, or at least uh, scientists that aren't men. And I think that's because they already face a lot of rejection and scrutiny. And so there's this harder shell that's like, they understand what it's like to just completely reject somebody or completely discredit them from the get go. Um, I have had instant like instances with like male scientists that have been like very like puffy chest challenging me. And I'm always like, I have nothing to prove to you keep puffing. I'm going to go back to my greenhouse. And that, those have been funny to watch happen because they always want to start an argument or a debate. And I just you don't take the bait, you know, <laughs> yeah, that should be a t-shirt. Keep puffing. I'm going to go to my greenhouse. <laughs> uh, but in the art world, uh, what I think I've experienced more of, which is interesting, is a lot of jealousy. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have noticed a lot of my artist friends you know, that people, they're really supportive of you. And then the second you start to get that trajectory. Yeah. And everyone's got a different definition, definition of success. Your success is just reaching whatever goal you're aiming for. Yeah. I was reaching mine and I was happy and I would watch some of my artist friends just kind of like poo poo it. Or when things started blowing up for me, they would say things, things went from like, Hey man, I love that you're doing this. It went from that to, ah, oh, fuck you. Or, Oh, must be nice. Like I started noticing that more and more. And I just had to tell those friends like, look, man, I'm not doing this to make you jealous. I'm doing this because I'm living my best life and I'm doing what's right. Happy. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not worried. I'm not thinking about you whenever I'm making art. I'm thinking about me and the people I want to share it with. And uh, I think, yeah, sure. Jealousy is a form of rejection. People that, they just stop leaving an opening for you. They, your artist friends are like, I can't, I can't add artist friends and follow me. And they would message me and go, I just, I just can't handle watching. Like literally I can't handle watching the success. Wow. And I'm like, I, you're missing out. I was like, I'm like, you know, you can't live your life thinking that way. Or you're going to end up fucking alone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. All those things are just ways we've, uh, you know, like any, you know, like we were talking about racism earlier, that there are all ways that we've been taught how to be in the world, right? And and part of what we've taught is scarcity, and you know, uh, something uh, a lot for you means that there, there's less for me. Yep. I'm going to guess that a lot of times, like the people you're describing as other artists who are <laughs> jealous of your work, is that I th I think from what I observe, also you tend to be someone who does do that sort of like you're doing the behind the scenes stuff, and then you release it, and then all of a sudden it's just wildly popular, and like, do you have any description for what's happening there? Like that kind of magic? Do you think it's really that you're just like doing stuff that matters so much to you and maybe that you also just don't see exist in the world. So there's just like sort of a magic that happens when they come out. Yeah. I think it's a, f a couple of things. Um, and I do not mean for this to sound like I'm tooting my own horn at all. Um, uh, but, uh, I do bust my ass. So I, I think I can give myself a little bit of credit. Okay, um, please do. So a few things, uh, I put a lot of care and passion into my ideas and I primarily want to make things that are, uh, sort of non-existent, not entirely, but like my grow a damn journal, there wasn't a good plant journal out there. There wasn't a plant journal that encouraged you to approach your plants scientifically while also retaining a bit of humor. Um, I think that was well received. I like to mix science with humor and art and science. And not a lot of artists do that, um, that we may see that change, but I think that's well received, but I tried to like, when I have an idea, I'll Google it. I'll Google the shit out of it. I'll do all the research I can to see has this been done. And if it has, what does this person's look like? Cause I don't want to, I don't want to make something too similar and how can I tweak it and make offer something different? I work really good. I, I work really well when there's voids, if there's a void, I, I believe you should feel, you should fill it. If there's a vacuum, fill it and it will do well. If you do it well, I also Especially have, if it's an idea that came to you, like, you know, cause it comes to you probably because you already cared about it and you're thinking about it. And if then there's also no, nothing else that exists like it, it seems like a pretty good, pretty good reason to make something. Yeah. It's a great recipe for like, oftentimes the things I make 
are you're right because the idea came to me and i wanted to see it like the crystallized insects i wanted to see what a crystallized insect would look like i had the idea i couldn't find anything online and i was like what does this look like in real life and it blew up um if it's something that i need like i was like man i really need a good plant journal I needed one. I wasn't thinking about everyone else. I was like, I need one. And then I think if I need one, how many more people need one? Right. Yeah. So, so where, what do you feel like actually inspires some of those ideas? I mean, how do you, or, you know, uh, this is like the art question. Where do you go to get your ideas or do you, you just feel like you're stumbling into them through the things that you're naturally doing every day? Uh, nature, a thousand percent. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, to be honest, some of the best technology and innovation that we see comes from nature. It comes, it's inspired by nature. That's like the best engineer in the universe. So when I am feeling uninspired, you know, I say this all the time, when I'm feeling uninspired, the first thing I do is I get off social media because when you're feeling uninspired, the last thing you need to do is compare yourself to others. It will destroy you. Um, and I get outside. I spend time in my greenhouse. I go for hikes. I crawl through caves. Uh, I spend time in the garden. If I'm outside long enough, those things inspire, those have inspired my favorite and my most well-received ideas. All of them have been derived from my observations, uh, in nature. Do, do all of those activities also serve as a thing that helps you contend with anxiety when you're experiencing it, when you're like having to put your stuff out in the world and you're feeling a lot of social anxiety and all that stuff you talked about earlier? Yeah. So like, for instance, you know, say I'm like all tangled up about humanity and society and the, all the anxieties that come with other humans, the, all I got to do is go crawl in a cave, crawl through some passage that's a mile long under highways and under everyone's feet, I'm in a place where most humans wouldn't even venture if there was money on the line. Like I am going somewhere where most humans will never go. A select few who are curious will get muddy and squeeze through a tight hole to see what chambers and minerals are under our feet. When I do that, that reminds me that there's so much more to planet earth than humans. When I'm out in the garden and I'm worried about, oh my God, like, is this idea going to be well received or, Oh my God, I'm like not posting enough on social media. And I go through all the stupid human anxieties. Yeah. If I see a hummingbird fluttering back and forth, trying to collect nectar, or I see, you know, like, a some insect running for its life from a praying mantis that's hanging from a leaf waiting to catch it and eat it. I'm like, wow, oh my God, there's, there's a lot of shit happening here outside of my anxieties. So it, it does help to see, everything big and large occurring on our planet adjacent to our silly anxieties. Not all of them are silly, but I think a lot of them are. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the quickest ways to get me out of my own anxiety is similar, which is, uh, you know, um, a few years ago I would tell friends, I was at a point where I was just starting to like really get into science and I came to, to that through physics. That was sort of my entry point. And not by any training or anything. I just sort of stumbled into, I think quantum physics just has had sort of like a cultural moment, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think part of it is because it is this um, metaphor for holding different tensions that seem like they don't fit. Like general mm -hmm. relativity and like quantum mechanics don't actually jive, but somehow they're still true, right? Yeah. But so I had stumbled into it and... Uh, at some point I was telling friends that I felt like I either wanted to be an astronaut at 36 or I wanted to be a whale photographer. <laughs> and I had a friend who was like, Brandy, what on earth are the, like, what's the thread between those two things? I just really don't get it. And I was like, <laughs> honestly, I think it's all this feeling in me that like my body feels like if I were in space looking back at the earth or if I'm in the water photographing a whale. They're all so much bigger than me. Like there are things mm -hmm. in nature I can see that I can use to go, I'm so small and like a really good way that helps me do exactly what you're talking about, which is like, mm -hmm. there's so much more going on outside of what's happening in this jumbled brain of mine. Ah, oh, you know, yeah. I just, it, it just like instantly calms my body to think about and similarly, like if I hear gravity making sound, you know, like the first time that we heard gravity chirp, 
you know, like, yeah. it's just such a bizarre, mind blowing idea that gravity <laughs> actually makes sound. Yeah. And you know, you can listen to that online now cause it, it apparently happens all the time and we just now have the instrumentation to listen, but like, and sometimes when I'm feeling really anxious, I'll actually go Google that and be like, really? I just want to hear what that sounds like because something in the cosmic universe millennia ago crashed together that was so infinitely large i like literally our our brains just can't wrap their heads around them and now today the sound from that has traveled to us and we had miraculously the instrumentation to capture it <clears throat> and now i get to listen to it <laughs> that's wild it's just it it really does something weird for my anxiety <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess my sound similar to that is like, I'll go listen to like audio recordings of stalactites dripping in caves. And it's like something like, yeah, it's for, for, for you, it's like size. For me, it's like age. Like I'm sitting here listening to water funnel through and drip out of formations that are, you know, 200,000 years old. And they're just growing so slow and they've been here for far longer than I can come far longer than any of my troubles. Like, <laughs> and there's something very humbling, like, wow, there's a lot of activity here that, um, yeah, I have my bullshit, but man, there's so much more shit out there than my, a lot of cool shit besides my bullshit. A lot of cool shit. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to cover today that you feel like you'd love to talk about? Oh man. Is there? I don't know. I mean, we did a pretty great job of covering covered some stuff. I don't now. really, yeah, I don't, we talked about some things I don't usually really talk about, um, on other podcasts, you know, usually uh, it is really refreshing to not just talk about like science and art. And it's, it's nice to talk about like other human, human things. Human things. <laughs> yeah. That's what I figure. I mean, like I said, I feel like you know, of course I came to you for that reason. Originally I, the science and art and just seeing someone who was combining those. So, <clears throat> so brilliantly and, um, in the way that you do. And I was like, well, you know, I really want to talk about that. Cause I still think that there's such a need to talk about why that's important. You know, what, yeah. what art serves in science and what science serves in art and all those things. But I also was like, I'm fairly certain that people ask him these questions all the time. And what's really present for me right now, like I said, is, you know, really, especially because I think one of the big things you talk about is curiosity. I was like, what's really compelling to me is, is this tension between what it means to experience trauma and how that might actually fuel your curio curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I never like, that's the intersection. I like in my own head, I'm, I guess I'm like, Oh my God, I had such a dark fucked up life. I'm going to just like get away from humans and go explore and g go through caves. And uh, in, in my I head, escape. I, yeah, but there, I guess there, there has to be a connection there because, um, maybe like, is there a connection between trauma and curiosity. I think there's a connection between trauma and creativity. Um, and I think creativity is like, I guess, okay. Yeah. If I'm going to sit here and say that there's a connection between trauma and creativity, which I strongly believe, um, I'm not saying go traumatize someone to make them a better artist <laughs> at all, right. but I think some of the best artists, uh, have, survive some bit of trauma. Well, creativity is the end result of curiosity. So trauma would inspire curiosity where the outlet or the end result would yield creativity. So mm -hmm. I've never thought deeply about the connections between, between trauma and this need to explore and be curious. Cause usually the you know, the conversation is when you're traumatized, you pull inward and inward and inward, you don't really explore outward, but mm -hmm. curiosity, I guess, can go either way. Yeah. I, and I, I just, I don't think I've ever really made the connection before either until literally like the last couple of weeks. And, you know, like I said, just doing some of my own writing and thinking about, you know, weirdly, a lot of the people I follow, like, you know, authors that most people would know by name 
are folks who mm-hmm. have survived a lot of trauma and also talk about their trauma a lot and also tend to be people who aren't really interested in stuff that doesn't matter. Like they really want to talk about things that matter, you mm-hmm. know, and won't sort of suffer. Not that they can't be lighthearted, you know, humor's, yeah. humor's still there. I actually think some of the most people, some people who have gone through the most trauma are the most humorous. So I think there's also <laughs> I agree. a connection between <laughs> like comedians, like some of the best comedians, of course, are folks who have gone through a lot of trauma. And like you're saying, of course, don't willingly go through trauma in order to create good art, but (laughs) cause I think art can be created out of joy and beauty and Mm -hmm. love and all those things too. But I do, I have been exploring, I have been exploring if there is some sort of connection that actually that's part of what, I think it's at least part of what drives my philosophical side, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, why are we here? Why does it, why does it matter? What does it mean for us on a daily basis? And, and and that's such a scientific inquiry. Why are we mm-hmm. here? What does it yeah. mean? Those sorts of things. I have no fucking idea how to answer any of those. <laughs> no, that's t- entirely rhetorical. But <laughs> that's a whole I, conversation. I do ask myself those questions about every five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for having the conversation with me and being game to talk about those interesting considerations, especially yeah. with trauma. Cause you know, it's not easy to hop on a call with a stranger all the time. <laughs> you're like, please tell me about your trauma. I mean, uh, Hey, like everything's kind of crumbling. And so I don't, you know, I'm down to talk about anything. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for being someone who pays attention, not just to yourself, but to other people in the world and the, the good stuff that you're up to. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you for being on the show. It was a pleasure. So you're going to be obsessed with Tyler now as much as I am. And the entire Instagram world is right. (laughs) That's what I thought. Um, Not long after Tyler and I wrapped this conversation, I saw something from Margot Feldman, a writer and educator, say something about trauma and healing on Instagram. And I loved it. So I wanted to share. I'll, um, I'll link to the post in the show notes for this episode. But here's what it said. The more I heal my trauma, the more I learn to listen to my body, the louder my trauma responses become. The more I heal my trauma, the more I learn to listen to my body, the softer my trauma responses become. Meaning, I think the more that you're working through your trauma, you'll start to hear what your body is saying more loudly, but the more you engage with those, that the softer the responses from them become. So I love that. I thought I'd share. Otherwise, find Tyler online at tylerthrasher.com and on Instagram at tylerthrasherart. You can also find links to everything that we mentioned from the show in my show notes and everything else we talked about on my site at thisplusthat.com slash episodes and go to Tyler's episode specifically. As always, I want to acknowledge that I do these interviews from my home on the native land of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho people, but you can otherwise find me online at thisplusthat.com and at thisplusthatpod across Twitter and Instagram. Thanks also to the team at Upfire Digital for the audio processing. You can find them online at upfiredigital.com. All of my music is by the folks at slip.stream. Find them online at that same address. And if you're a plus kind of person like me, you like just mashing a bunch of things together and seeing what the common threads are and wondering what's so important about doing this sort of mashing, (laughs) you can sign up for my newsletter at thisplusthat.com. In it, you'll get inside peeks at important connections I'm making at the intersections of other seemingly unconnected ideas. Like, I don't know, theology and fermentation, because I'm a bit of a fermentation nerd. Uh, You'll also get podcast announcements, so you never miss a show when it drops, plus additional commentary and behind-the-scenes thoughts from beyond these conversations, curated links to my other favorite uh, recent idea-matching people in media. Like today, I was putting together a newsletter, and I'm going to share this link where... Someone had made this digi- has made this digital art of what looks like a realistic whale jumping through a cloud as a plane flies by. It's just wild to see. So I share things like that that I think are really cool and mashing strange, seemingly unrelated things together, like whales and clouds. <laughs> it's also the only place uh, I'm going to allow y'all to reply to me and give me guest recommendations. So one example is my friend Brenton Way, who's an amazing theater performer and writer and 
language person. He's just a beautiful human. He keeps telling me I should talk to Nathan Mirvold, who has some sort of wild connections between bread and hurricanes. So I would love for you to tell me wild things like that by replying to my email. So you got to sign up for the newsletters. Also, I had this really incredible conversation or, or, or a piece of this conversation I had with Tyler actually included the intersections of plants and capitalism. And it's long enough that I'm not going to do it as an Easter egg in the show, I think I'm going to give it to you as bonus content. So if you sign up for my newsletter, I'm going to send you that chunk of this, of this conversation that I'm not including here. And it's the only place you're going to be able to access it. If you want to hear me and Tyler talk about plants and capitalism, I might also include some other bonus content that is from these recordings beyond what I've included in the actual final episodes. So make sure to go sign up for that. Again, it's thisplusthat.com and there should be plenty of places where you can see where you'll sign up for that newsletter. And lastly, please rate and subscribe. If you love it, give it five stars. If you don't, maybe don't rate it at all, <laughs> but definitely subscribe so you don't miss an episode and make sure to tell other people about it. All your other idea mashing people who love this kind of thing. All right. Okay. I love you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation between me and Tyler and I can't, I can't wait until next time. All right. Bye y'all. <laughs>